dear. Hi. In the, uh, in the past few years, I have done seven book tours in six countries to support my first four novels. That's a lot of traveling, and it's a lot of small talk with a lot of strangers. <laughs> in the beginning, I was so excited about getting The Sparrow published that I would look for excuses to tell people in airports that I was a novelist <laughs> on a book tour. And people would say, cool, what's your book about? Um, and then, um, uh, I, then I would have to tell them it's, um, it's, it's about Jesuits in space. <laughs> Those of you who have tried to get friends to read The Sparrow know what I'm up against. Um, you say Jesuits in space, and people get that glazed look in their eyes, you know, and they start to back away, and you're going, no, no, really, it's good. Um, it's science fiction, but it's really, really classy science fiction. It's got like Latin and everything. <laughs> so when people asked me what my third book was about, I was able to say it's about the Jewish underground near Genoa during the Nazi occupation of Italy. And people would always say, wow, I'd like to read that, which was such a relief. When authors are on tour, they are constantly asked, where do you get your ideas? All authors get that question all the time. Where do you get your ideas? Where do you get your ideas? Where do you get your ideas? And it's, it's hard not to get punchy when you hear that over and over again. So um, I kind of got into the habit of saying, uh, Walmart. <laughs> Aisle five. <laughs> all, all the ideas are imported from China now. Um, but my husband made me see that there was a question underneath that question. He, he made me see that when people ask, where do you get your ideas, what they really want to know is, um, why does an author decide to write about one thing and not another? You know, out of the universe of ideas, why did you choose this one? So to explain why I got started on A Thread of Grace, I have to tell you two things about myself. Um, first of all, my maiden name is Doria, and the more elderly and august among us <clears throat> will recall that the Andrea Doria was an ocean liner that, sh that sank in the 1950s. Anyway, the Andrea Doria was named after a famous 15th century Italian admiral who won the Sea Battle of Lepanto, which was an extremely big deal at the time, and nobody remembers it anymore. Uh, and Andrea Doria ruled Genoa um, for many years afterwards. Now, my grandfather took great pride in pointing out that we were the descendants of the great Andrea Doria. On the other hand, Grandpa himself did time for armed robbery. <clears throat> so the ancestral glory was pretty much wrung out of the gene pool by the time the name got down to us. So my dad didn't make a big deal about Italy. And to be honest, before I started working on that third novel, I was as ignorant of modern Italian history as most Americans are, which is to say, very ignorant indeed. OK, so before you read A Thread of Grace, what do you know about Italian history? Mussolini was a fascist. Uh, Italy was Germany's ally in World War II. Uh, and I knew the names of battles like Anzio and Monte Cassino, but only because they made movies about them in the 1960s. Okay, so that's it. That's the level of dead ignorance with which I started, which explains to you partly why it took seven years to write this book. Okay, here's the second thing I have to tell you about myself. Um, every year, there are several thousand conversions to Judaism, and in 1993, mine was among them. Um, it's a long story, and before you ask, no, my husband isn't Jewish. Um, so I made a mixed marriage after 32, or 23 years, right? Um, but what it means in this context is that I am an Italian by heritage and I am a Jew by choice, okay? So one evening on book tour, I walked into the bookstore and I saw a book called, um, uh, it was by Alexander Stiele, and it's called Benevolence and Betrayal, Five Italian Jewish Families Under Fascism. And my first reaction, I'm not proud of this, um, was Italian Jews. I didn't know there were Italian Jews. I thought I was the only one. <laughs> and, and my second thought was, what do they eat? <laughs> you know, like lox, parmesan, you know, kugel carbonara. You know. So everything. I learned, as I read Alexander Stiele's book, was a surprise on almost every level. 2,000 years ago, the historian Flavius Josephus estimated that 10% of the, 
of the population of the Roman Empire was Jewish. For scale, in the United States today, Jews make up less than 2% of the population. So 10% of the Roman Empire. And in general, Rome was a pretty good place for Jews until the Emperor Constantine made Christianity the state religion, which is when things got ugly fast. After the fall of the empire, the Italian peninsula broke up into a number of small warring states. Now, in some places, and during some of the next 1,600 years, Italy was the best place in Europe to be Jewish. At other times, and in other places, it has been the most backward and intolerant. The word ghetto was coined in Venice. The papal states had an appalling record of vicious anti-Semitism. Even so, there have always been regions of the peninsula where Jews were a welcome part of the general community. And one of those times was during the Holocaust. On September 8th of 1943, the Jewish population of Italy is believed to have been 50,000 souls. 20 brutal months later, when Germany finally surrendered, approximately 43,000 Jews were still alive in Italy. That may be the highest survivor rate in occupied Europe. It's hard to get exact figures. Many people were in hiding. But from 85 to 87 percent of the Jews in Italy survived the Holocaust. And that is all the more remarkable because the figure includes thousands of foreign Jews who were in hiding in Italy when the occupation began. People tend to believe that the Dutch showed remarkable solidarity with their Jewish neighbors because everybody knows about a handful of Jews who were hidden in that attic with Anne Frank and her family. People often forget that all of them were ratted out just a few months before the end of the war. Certainly, the Danes deserve respect and gratitude for smuggling 7,100 Jews across their country to safety in neutral Sweden. Each dash across Denmark was a death-defying risk. But to understand Jewish survival in Italy, in occupied Italy, you have to imagine 50,000 Anne Franks hidden in apartments and houses and barns, in seminaries, convents, and monasteries, not for days, not for weeks, not for months, but for nearly two years. The Gestapo and the Waffen SS searched door to door, town to town, valley to valley. They offered large cash bounties for Jews and carried out public executions of anyone caught concealing them. They made it a capital offense if a Jew were found hiding on your land, hoping that that would encourage farmers to drive Jews away. Neither the bribes nor the intimidation worked. And many Italians paid for their decency with imprisonment, torture, and death. Why? What accounts for this extraordinary response to the Holocaust? For 60 years, the world has asked what went wrong in Germany. To me, the question is, what went right in Italy? 